Shabbat Shalom and good morning one and all. Thank you for joining us this morning at the Olive Tree Congregation. Thank you if you are with us by uh, Facebook Live this morning. We are delighted that you are here to worship the Lord God of heaven and earth with us. And uh, we trust that by God's grace and his mercy, uh, we will do just that. We will offer up to him a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and uh, a, a sacrifice that will honor him and bring glory to his name. And as we do that, as we minister to him in worship and praise, it is our prayer that he will minister to us, that he will meet with us, that we will hear from him and that we will be changed as a result this morning. And so again, I thank you so much for being with us and, uh, and just are looking forward to what the Lord is going to do as we uh, worship him together. And so with that, I am going to sound the shofar and uh, would encourage you to let it sound, stir your heart to listen for the Lord and to hear from him this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I would like to uh, introduce to you our worship leader this morning, uh, Mr. Brian Allen. Brian, please come and lead us as we worship the Lord this morning in song. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Uh, the Lord is with us. So whatever you have going on, um, any anxiety, any fear, any frustration you got in your hearts, um, just want to tell you now to remind you, like, gather it all up right now, get it all into a pile, and uh, bring it to the Lord. He is strong enough to carry it, and not only is he strong enough to carry it, but you can trust him with it. So let's tell him that we trust him with a song. Oh 
Amen. Amen. I want to read a psalm for you. Psalm 103, beginning at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so great, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. Let's bless the Lord together in a song. sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, 
Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. And sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Got another reading from Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And, and day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power. For you did create all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Friends, the, the Lord rules over the nations. He reigns over the earth. And he is doing something now in the world that's unique in our eyes. We haven't seen it before, but in history, plagues have come before him, plagues have come after him, and he has his purposes for what he's doing. He has his reasons. And I just want to remind us all that he provides for his children. He takes care of us. Even when we die, he has made provision. He provides resurrection for us in the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. And so he reigns today on the throne. He is holy. He is worthy. Let's worship him together. Lightning, 
Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I'm filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I see. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Thank you, Brother Brian. Glorious songs, perfect for this day in our text this morning in our study in the book of Revelation. As we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord by reciting the Shema and uh, calling ourselves to remember God's uniqueness and the rule and reign of his kingdom forever and ever, uh, and also reciting the Vihafta. I want to read a few verses from Psalm 66. Uh, Psalm 66 is a psalmist's reflection on God's uh, glory and majesty. It's filled with praise. Um, he reflects on the fact that God answered his prayers. And uh, as we come to him this morning, we are offering worship to him, but we're also coming to him in prayer. And so listen to these opening verses of Psalm 66 as we prepare to worship the Lord through the Shema. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name, Selah. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There, let us rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Let's worship the Lord together as we recite these words from Deuteronomy 6. Shema Yisrael, 
Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem, Kivod Malchuto, Le'olam Va'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. And as we worship the Lord and remind ourselves of his uniqueness, we also want to remember his will for our lives. And uh, this version of the Shema helps us remember how simple it really is to love him with everything we've got and to love each other the same way we love ourselves. So together, let's recite the Via Hafta. Via Hafta et Adonai Elohecha, Bechol Levavcha, Ubechol Nafshecha, Ubechol Meodecha. Vihafta l'reacha kamocha, vishte hamitzvot ha'ela kal ha'torah tulia v'gam habana'im. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments sum up the whole of the Torah and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence on this Shabbat morning in Yeshua's name. Lord, we thank you that in him we are clothed in his righteousness, that we stand before you undefiled and holy because of what you have done for us through his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we thank you that you welcome us as your children, your beloved ones. We thank you that we get to come to you and offer our worship and our praise to you, confident that you hear it and that you receive it because it comes to you in Yeshua's name and his authority and what he has done. Lord, we lift ourselves to you for blessing this morning. Meet with us, stir our hearts to hear from you through the worship, Lord, through your word, uh, through our time together and fellowship. Father, may you be exalted in our hearts and our minds that we might love you more fully, more completely, that we might love one another as we love ourselves and that your name might be exalted through our lives. Lord, we also want to remember to pray this morning for the leaders of our nation. We pray for our president and vice president, for the governor of our respective states, Lord, those who are making decisions that have profound impacts on our lives and our livelihoods. Lord, we pray for wisdom for these people. We pray for freedom from corrupt corruption and greed. Lord, we pray uh, for hearts of compassion that really want to serve the people they've been elected to serve. Lord, we thank you that you were able to do that. Raise up wise counselors to lead and to guide. And Lord, we thank you, though, that our hope is ultimately in you, that you are our sovereign king, and it is you that we trust. So help us to remember that this morning as we worship you in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. 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 I would like to invite Caleb Cook, who is going to read our scripture for us this morning. All right. Today, we're going to be looking into Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Yeshua Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest uh, to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Yeshua, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Yeshua. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, 
write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his voice was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. And as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you, Caleb. Let's pray as we look into God's word. Father, thank you again for the day, for the Shabbat. Thank you for the gift of the rest that you call us to in Messiah. Thank you for the gift of your word. I ask, Lord, that you would meet with us and that your spirit would be at work to bring light and understanding uh, into our hearts and minds uh, as we look at the text. And, Lord, that you would work by your spirit to help us uh, heed and apply your word to our lives uh, today. Uh, Lord, I ask, as always, that your spirit would fill me as well and that I would be a useful tool in your hand as we look into your word. We thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you for being here. We look forward to your blessing in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Now, back in December, um, would you have uh, wanted to have seen a, a video of, uh, a um, not a video, but a um, a uh, instruct yeah, an instructional video on how to prepare for the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, don't you wish that someone had made something like that available? Uh, imagine how it might have changed your response to what's going on. You would have been better prepared, uh, less confused, and more hopeful. Uh, now, su suppose somebody also was able to tell you exactly how bad the pandemic would be. Uh, but also give instructions on how to protect yourself and ensure that you would survive and thrive once it was over. Well, it would be great to have all that information, wouldn't it? Well, that's exactly what the book of Revelation is like. The book of Revelation, you'll forgive this analogy, is like a prepper's guide to the last days. Uh, it isn't about arming ourselves. It isn't about uh, laying up food for ourselves. It's about preparing ourselves spiritually to live through these last days, the days that exist between Yeshua's ascension back to heaven and his return back to earth uh, for, well, his return for, the, for us believers, and then ultimately his final return to rule and to reign. And the book of Revelation is a guide to help us live through those last days. And it comes to us from somebody who knows exactly what those days are going to hold and what we need in order to live through those parts of it that we are going to be living through as his followers. And if you stop and you think about it, uh, the anxiety that many of us are living through uh, today is, uh, is, is because we don't know what's going to happen, right? We don't know how to respond. We don't know how to restore our lives uh, to, to normal. And so suppose somebody came to us in our immediate circumstances and said, look, I know everything you need to know. I have all the answers. 
and you need to look to me and trust me. Well, you would say, yeah, okay, that's the person I'm going to follow. And that's exactly the message of today's text in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. John salutes his readers. He greets us by pointing us to the hero of his letter. And of course, we said last week in the introduction that the, the, the book, the revelation, is a revelation of Jesus. It is Jesus' revelation of himself to us. And so as we listen to John's uh, description this morning, what I want us to be thinking about, what is John's message to us uh, in our own times of uncertainty and suffering? And so what is that message? And I think the message that comes through from this text is a pretty simple one. And so I want to share my screen with you. Let's see, I need to launch this first. And now, sorry, try that one more time. There we go. So this is the message, learn from the last days. He has this, he has this, he meaning who? He meaning Messiah, Jesus, meaning God. And he says this to us because he wants us to have a rock to stand on in the midst of the shaky times in which we live because times are not going to get better as Yeshua's return draws near. They are going to get worse and worse and we're gonna need that rock uh, more and more. And so as we look at our text this morning, the first thing I want us to look at is that, that when things are uncertain, God says, remember, I have this. I have this. And so John greets his readers by reminding them, by reminding us who is in control. And he gives us this verbal picture of who God is, the God who is the sovereign Lord over all the things that are going to take place uh, in the letter that he is writing to us. And so that's what he wants us to get. John greets his readers by reminding them who is in control. It's a verbal affirmation. And so John reminds us that, uh, let's see, I'm sorry. <laughs> He says, he says, these are the letters to the seven churches. Look, in chapter 1, verse 4, he says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. And remember, I pointed out last week that when he says in Asia, he's not talking about, uh, he's not talking about Asia, the Far East, as we would know it. He's talking about Asia, what we would know as Turkey, uh, because that was what was called Asia during the Roman Empire, the days in which John wrote. And so he's writing to the believing communities, writing to seven churches. Now don't think of just a church, like a, a community, a singular community, like the Olive Tree Congregation. You wanna think church in terms of the believing community of an entire city. So if you took Olive Tree and then added to it many of the other believing communities in the greater Chicagoland area, that's to whom he is writing. He's writing to a large community of believers. And so he has a, he has a, um, I'm sorry, let's see. His, his idea here is, is he wants to point us to who is in control. So look with me, if you will, at verses four and, uh, verses four and following. He says this, he says, uh, he wants to tell us who God is. And he says, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn of, of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he gives us this picture of the Lord, and he, let's 
And he breaks it down for us in this way. He says this, this letter, he says the grace and peace that we have. And so when John mentions grace and peace, it's the same thing that Paul mentions in many of his letters to the believing communities to whom he wrote. And he says grace and peace. And so he's, he's saying that the two things we need most, which is God's grace, that's his enablement, his divine enablement for us, and peace, that is the result of his enablement, that is the fulfillment of all of his promises, uh, everything we need, the well-being that we are ultimately looking for and yearning for comes to us from God. And John tells us who this God is. He says it's from, it's from the self-existent Father, the I Am. And we won't take time to look there, but if you want to make a note, look up Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, and Isaiah 44, verse 6, where these very same attributes God claims for himself, God the Father claims for himself. And he's letting us know in these attributes when he was speaking to Israel, he was saying to Israel, look, I am always here. I always have been. I always will be. I am in complete control. There is nothing outside of my control. I am self-existent, and I am not dependent on anyone or anything, and what I say goes. And that's what John is reminding us of. It's from God, the Father, who is a self-existent one. And then he goes on and he says, he's, it's from the omnipresent spirit. And this, is a little, this one's a little confusing for us. Uh, look what he says. He says, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And so when you think about these seven spirits, I don't want you to think about seven individual spirits. I want you to think about the perfection of the Holy Spirit as represented by the number seven. Because if you look in, uh, in the letters that the messengers are going to carry to the seven churches of Asia, you read seven different times he who has to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so the idea is that the seven spirits, this image of the seven spirits is the perfection of the Holy Spirit, who is the one communicating through these letters to uh, the people. So it's God the Father who's self-existent. It's God the Holy Spirit who is uh, omniscient, knows everything, sees everything, is everywhere present. And he goes on to say, it's from Jesus Messiah. And he breaks down for us who Jesus is. And he says, the faithful witness. And if you want another good cross reference here would be Psalm 89, which is a psalm about God's eternal covenant with David. And in many ways, Jesus was a, mit a witness in his earthly ministry in terms of knowing what was truly in the heart of men. He was a witness in terms of what he revealed to us about God the Father. He was a, a witness in many different ways, but in a very significant and important way, he is a witness to God's faithfulness to his promises to David to, as the king, that he would put a, a, a king on David's throne who would live forever. And that is also brought out in the next part where he says, he's the firstborn from the dead. And so Jesus is the living proof of eternal life. He is the proof that there is life after death. And he wants us to remember that. And of course, that is a reflection on Psalm 16. And then he continues and says, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is a sovereign ruler. And, and that's a, a reflection also on Psalm 2. And I, I just want to point something out in passing is that uh, according to uh, one scholar, uh, there are over 500 allusions or references to Old Covenant scriptures in the book of Revelation. Uh, another uh, preacher uh, said that more than half of the verses in the book of Revelation contain either a direct quote or a clear allusion to some text of the Old Covenant scriptures. And so it's important as we look at this picture of Yeshua that John is giving to us verbally in these, in these, uh, in these verses, it isn't something new. It is more clearly revealed, certainly, in the person of Messiah now that he has come. 
but it is, uh, it is all rooted in what God has revealed ahead of time about the Messiah. And so that's why we believe Jesus is the Messiah. That's why we can be confident whether we are Jewish or Gentile. We are confident that Jesus is God's promised Messiah because God told us so many things about what he would be like and what he would do. And John is here reflecting on many of those things and encouraging us to remember who it is that is in control, the sovereign God of the universe. And so he goes on now and he, let's see, he goes on and he tells us not only who God is, but he tells us what God has done in verses, uh, the end of verse five uh, and through verse six. And so if you look in the middle of verse five there, it says, to him who, and then it goes on and it gives some references. Uh, and then in the middle of verse six, he repeats to him. And so he's picking up the thought. And so what he's saying at the, in the middle of verse five is to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So be it. It is, it is sure. It is done. That is what is going to happen. God is going to get the glory. But between this to him and to him and the glory that God deserves, because he tells us what God has done. And he says this, and he says to him who loves us and releases us. He loves us. He tells us God loves us. We want to, God deserves the glory. All the glory of everything he does comes back to him. But he is the one who loves us. He looks down on us in our fallen condition, and he doesn't disdain us. He doesn't hate us. Yes, his righteousness demands judgment. His righteousness uh, brings with it when, when, when it must, it brings wrath. But his judgment and his anger are his strange work because he is ultimately the God of love. And John reminds us right away, he says, look what God has done. He has loved us. He loves us. And that's a present tense verb he uses. He is currently loving us. And so in the midst of these shaky times, what a beautiful reminder that it is the God who is in control is the God who loves us. And how has he loved us? He says he has released us from our sins by his blood. Of course, obvious reflection on the, the work of Messiah on the cross, dying on a Roman execution stake to pay the penalty for our sin. God said in the garden to our ancestors, he said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And he told us right from the beginning that the penalty of sin is death, initially physical death, and then ultimately spiritual death and separation from him for all eternity. Because God loves us though, he has worked and released us from sin, released us from the penalty of sin. And when we have our resurrected bodies, we will ultimately be released from the, the presence of sin and its power over our lives. And he says he does that by his blood, by the shedding of his blood, even as our ancestors' sins were temporarily forgiven, and they were cleansed through the shedding of the atoning sacrifices of Yom Kippur, so too all of us who know Messiah experience that release and that cleansing that comes from Messiah's blood. And then he goes on and he says, and he made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, meaning that he has transformed us. He has brought us from the kingdom of man and the kingdom of death into the kingdom of God and the kingdom of life. He has brought us from a kingdom of corruption to a kingdom of perfection, and he has made us priests to God. He has made us those who serve God, the God of, of heaven and earth, even as our ancestors were intended to serve God as they tended the garden. And so, so he, he is the one 
to whom uh, John wants us to look and wants us to understand. And he finishes up with, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And so he, he, he wants us to remember that it's God who is at work. God is the one who has us in all of the things that are going on. This is what John is reminding his readers of over and over again. And then he goes on and he finishes up by saying in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, which is a direct reference to Daniel chapter 7, verse, th verse 13, where there's this amazing picture of, of Messiah Jesus' arrival. And he says, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Amen. It is, pr it is true. It is attested to that not only does he save us and love us and, and release us and make us a kingdom and priests, but he is coming back to restore everything on this earth. And the emphasis here, of course, is from uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And it is uh, a scene where in Zechariah where the Messiah's return brings Israel to its knees and they mourn over the one who they rejected in his first visit. But John takes that and he expands that out to say, the whole world is going to have that mourning when they realize who it is that they rejected and turned their backs on. And so he says, Jesus is coming. He is coming with the clouds of the air. And so he's coming in glory. He will be, rec be recognized by who he is. But then look, at, look with me at verse 8, because John has given us all of these these things. And he's given us these two amens, these two, it's certain, it's true, it's validated. You can count on this. You can take it to the bank. And then as if it weren't enough that John fills our vision with this incredible picture of what God is going to do, then God himself breaks in and has something to say. And God says this, he gives us an affirmation. He says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty God. And there is debate amongst the scholars as to whether this is Yeshua speaking. Uh, and the reason, obviously, for that is who was, who is, and who is to come. And we're thinking about the return of Yeshua. We just read that in verse seven, but I believe that the more accurate way to understand this is that this is God himself. This is the father himself, once again, verbally for himself, affirming the things that God has told, that, that John has already told us about him. Is, was, and is to come. Again, it's that picture that we get from Isaiah of the ever-present one, of the self-existent one, of the one who is in authority over everything. And so he says it, it, is, it is to come the Almighty himself. And of course, the Almighty is a, a reference used over and over again in the Old Covenant scriptures for God himself, for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he is the one that we are looking forward to. He is the one who is going to come himself. And so do you see what John is doing here? Do you see what he is, he is working hard to get us to understand? He is showing us a picture, not a picture, but he has is, he is given us a verbal picture, if you will, of God being in complete control, saying, I have got this. I have got this. And he is saying this because he wants his readers, he wants us to be secure. I have got this. I have got this. 
in, in these shaky times, the first priority that we need to have in our lives, I think, is that we need to know the one who is coming. We're all born in the position of those who are going to mourn on his return because they have rejected him. And we are all born into that place where we are rejecting God, where our sin has separated us from him. And so the first thing God wants you to do in response and to hearing God say, I've got this, the question is, has he got you? Has he got you? Have you recognized your sin? Have you recognized that the way you've been living, the way you think, the way you deal with the people around you, uh, the truth you tell and the lies you tell, uh, the, the, the way you think about yourself first before everybody else, that this is sin and this is all a transgression before a holy God. And that sin separates you from him. And he says to you, I love you and I have given to you my son, your Messiah. And he has died for you as a, an atoning sacrifice for your sin. And you need to put your trust in him. And so God invites you to do that. And he says to you, I have this, but he has it for those who are his. And so the question is, do you, do you have him? Have you put your trust in him? And then for, for, for all of us who already know him, he wants us to hear this, I've got this, I've got this. You know, we're in the midst of some really difficult times. Uh, you know, our, our governor has released his plan to restore us to normalcy. And based on that plan, uh, unless a, a, a miracle cure comes up in the next couple of days, it's going to be a year or more before we are given permission to meet in mass in our sanctuary the way we once did. Now, I'm hoping it won't be the case, and I'm hoping there will be other ways for us to begin to join together uh, in physical proximity to each other. But, uh, but when things are shaky and our jobs are, you know, many of us are wondering about our jobs, and some of us have already suffered or beginning to suffer sig significant loss of income. And we're in a really shaky, shaky place. And what do you want to hear? when you're in that place. I was thinking about like if you're, if you're at the doctor's office and you've just been told the results of your test and you've been told that you have an advanced stage of cancer and the future is shaky, the future is uncertain. And what do you want to hear? Well, I think John is like the nurse coming into the office and looking you straight in the eye and saying to you, he's got this. He's got this. And then the doctor coming into the office and looking you straight in the eye and saying, I've got this. I've got this. I have what you need to defeat this threat. And so I'm not saying that God is saying to us, we will have victory in this life in every area we want victory. But I am saying that God wants us to know he has this and that he has all of the resources you and I need to not only weather the things that are going on in our lives today, to weather the loss of a job, to weather illness, to weather the death of someone close to us, uh, to weather the upheaval of, of all the things we, we used to know as normal that may never be that kind of normal again, that all of the resources for those things are in him. He says to us, I've got this, I've got this. And so not only does John give us this message by giving us this verbal picture of our Messiah, he goes on and he gives us <clears throat> a visual picture of our Messiah, a visual picture of our Messiah. And so look with me, if you will, beginning in verse 9, where he introduces himself to his readers. And he says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I think it's important that as we look at this 
introduction, John doesn't say, I, John, an apostle of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't exercise his authority in his introduction. Instead, he says, no, the one who is writing to you is in the same circumstance in which you find yourselves. I am writing to you as a peer amongst peers. I am writing to you as one who understands tribulation, who is living in exile because of my testimony for the Lord, because I have spoken up on his behalf and I have shared the good news with people. And he says that he was uh, on the island of called Patmos. And once again, I want to remind us that, uh, that this island was a small island off of what we would know as uh, Turkey now. And uh, it was a place of exile, one of the favorite places of a Roman emperor to exile his enemies. Uh, and uh, so he did that for John because of his proclamation of the gospel and because Christians in the first century would not acknowledge uh, Caesar, the emperor, as their Lord, because there was only one Lord, and that is the Lord Jesus himself. So he says he's on the island of Patmos. And so again, just by way of reminder, this is, this is the people to whom he is writing. And he says, he goes on and he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. And so when he says, I was in the spirit, he's telling us plainly, he says, I was, I was in a, an altered, if you will, an altered spiritual state that the spirit of God had worked in his heart and his mind to enable him to perceive things that he would not be able to perceive normally in the material world. And when he says it was on the Lord's day, there's a lot of debate as to exactly what that means. The traditional understanding is that the Lord's day is a reference to uh, the first day of the week to Sunday. And there is evidence that later in the first century or second century, that term began to become synonymous with Sunday, the first day of the week, but nowhere in the scriptures is the Lord's day ever directly equated with uh, the first day of the week, which is how it's typically expressed in the New Covenant scriptures. But in any case, he is with the Lord, he is in the spirit rather, on a specific day, and he said, I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. And so the sound of a trumpet, what does a trumpet do? If you're standing in a room full of people and, uh, and all of a sudden you hear a loud blast of a trumpet, you're going to turn and look. And that's exactly the point here, that God's voice, what he heard, commanded his attention. I'm going to put up a slide that kind of walks us through what John is describing for us in the coming verses. And he says this. <clears throat> he, so he, he draws a picture now of the Messiah for us. He tells us what he sees. And verse uh, 10, first of all, I'm sorry, and verse 11, he says, saying, write in a book or a scroll, it would have been a papyrus scroll, uh, what you see. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so he is, uh, I, I showed you that picture last week. I'm not going to take time to show it to you this week. But it's a, it's a series of seven churches that are spread out in uh, Asia, in the Roman province of Asia. And then he says this, he, he, he talks about Jesus himself, beginning in verse 12. He said, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And so basically verses 12 to 13 
paints a picture of Yeshua being in a position and being clothed with symbols of authority. He is in the center of these seven lampstands, meaning he is in command of those seven lampstands, and we'll see what those mean in just a minute. And he is clothed with garments, outer garments, that to John would have communicated uh, clear representations of authority, of authority, the robe reaching to the feet. And we think when we hear that, we think, of course, of the high priest's robe, which reached to his feet. And when he talks about a gold sash across his, uh, his breast, we think about that the high priest himself had a sash that was woven with gold threads. And so it is perhaps a picture of Yeshua as our high priest standing amongst these lampstands that we'll read later represent the churches to whom John is to write. And then he says, in the middle of the lampstand, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his chest with a gold, golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when, <clears throat> when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And so again, he's painting, he's, he's seeing this picture of the Lord Jesus. And the things that he describes for us all picture uh, aspects of who Jesus is, of his authority. And as the slide shows you, his white hair, like wool, is a picture of wisdom. And we read about that in the book of Proverbs. His eyes, like flames of fire, uh, is a picture of his ability to discern and to see through things, if you will, spiritual x-ray vision, clarifying vision. His feet like burnished bronze. Uh, there's debate about exactly what this means. My own view after studying it this week is that it's a symbol both of purity because of its, it's been fired and it's pure and it's, and it's shiny, it's, it's lacking. And it's also a picture of stability because bronze was used for the base of uh, the uh, tabernacle structure and the outer court was held up by bronze bases. So it has this picture of stability. And then he goes on and he says that his voice, like the sound of many waters, it's this idea of, of a compelling command, this overwhelming sense of authority that, and power that comes from a sound. And as I was reflecting on that this week, it reminded me of standing uh, at the fence right at the edge of Niagara Falls and, and, and having to yell to the people right next to me, because of the sound of the rushing water going over the edge into the abyss. And it's that same idea, this compelling command, it, is, it, it, it causes everything else to lose its emphasis. And he goes on and he says, in his hand, seven stars. And the idea of seven stars there is a picture of authority over others. And he continues and he says, uh, and out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. And that's, of course, a picture of God's word and his ability to judge rightly, dividing between one thing and another and holding us to account um, based on his truth, his word. And then he says, finishes up with face like the sun. Uh, it's a picture of overwhelming purity and power, overwhelming purity and power. And then he finishes up and he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. <laughs> I love that. I fell at his feet like a dead man. Verse 17, he, it was a spiritually, physically, emotionally overwhelming experience to see pictured in front of you, the Messiah Jesus represented to express the nature and the degree of his authority. He says, I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me. So not only is John overwhelmed, but then he says he placed his right 
hand on me. He placed his right hand on me. And it is another picture. It's the same, it's communicating the same thing, right? It's communicating the same thing that John was communicating in his verbal description of how God worked for our salvation in the previous verses. In verse 17b, he says, he paints him as the comforter. He says, don't be afraid. And and you just think about whatever you're going through today, whatever you're going through, wherever you're at, doesn't matter whether it's related to COVID, some other spiritual crisis in your life, whatever's going on, this picture of Jesus, that he is the comforter. He is reaching out to you today and he is touching you with his right hand and he is saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And why? Why should we not be afraid? Why should not? Why should John not be afraid? And he goes on and he says, I am the first and the last and the living one. And it's kind of like I was and I will be and I am. <laughs> and he's again, he's saying, I am the first, the last and the living one. I am the ever present one. I am the self existent one. I am the great I am. And he's saying, be comforted because I am as here with you. And then he goes on and he says, I was dead and behold, I am alive forever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. So he says in verses 17 and 18, he says, not only am I the ever present one and the one who is living here with you and we'll see, is living amongst the churches to whom John is writing. He says, I am the life giver, and I have the keys to death and Hades. I have the keys to death and Hades. And what is he saying? He's saying, I have the keys to the state of death. That is the separation of our soul from our body, our physical body, and then ultimately the separation of our soul from the living God, if that be the place we end up. And so he says, I am, I am the Lord of death. I am the Lord of the very thing we all dread. I am the Lord of the thing that all of us want to avoid at all costs. And he says, I have the keys to that. I can open Hades and let you out, or I can lock it and keep you in. And he says to John, look, I'm in control. I have this. I have this. And then he finishes with his commission, and I'll finish with this. He commissions John to write. He says, uh, he says, um, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. And then he goes on and he explains, he says, in the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches. All right. And so this is, these are the messengers of the seven churches. Now there's a debate as to whether these are angelic messengers, angels, as our English text translates it, but the Greek word doesn't necessarily mean an angelic messenger. It also means a human messenger. And so it is very possible that because of John's position as an apostle, that the churches to whom he is writing had sent emissaries to him to visit with him. And in writing these letters, will then send it back with those messengers. So whether the message is delivered by an angelic being in some way, or whether the message is developed Uh, delivered rather by a human messenger. God explains that Jesus is in control of the messengers who are bringing his message to the churches. And then he goes on and he explains the seven lampstands. And he says, each of those lampstands represents a church. And so as we think about lampstands, of course, we think about the menorah in the temple, which had seven branches in it. And so he says, this is, these are the people I want you to write to, people who are in the same place we are today, people who are experiencing persecution, 
people who are experiencing temptation to sin, people who are tempted to dumb down their testimony for the Lord because of the things that are going on in their lives. And he's writing this letter to us and he's saying to us and he's saying to the people that he is writing to in these churches, he is saying, look, I've got this. I've got this. I've got this. And I think that's where God wants us today. He wants us to hear him saying, I've got this. And so you look at whatever's going on in your life. You realize that your sin is gross and you're overwhelmed. And you think, how could God possibly forgive me? God's word to you today is, I've got this. He loves you. He has sent Messiah. Messiah has died to pay the penalty of your sin. And all you need to do is ask him to forgive you. All you need to do is put your trust in Messiah Jesus and God will forgive you and he will grant to you eternal and abundant life. And for those of us who are walking with him, you know, maybe you had a good week and maybe you're on the top of your game spiritually, but most of us had struggles throughout the week at, to one degree or another. Many of us are looking ahead at the future and thinking, how is this possibly going to work? How am I going to deal with this? Some of us are afraid to go out because, you know, we're in a high risk category and we've been told that, that this disease is going to kill us. And we want to retreat into ourselves. We want to withdraw. Perhaps you're in another kind of difficult emotional situation unrelated to COVID. But God says to you, I have this. Jesus says to you, I have this. And this is the one from whom we hear in the book of Revelation. This is the one to whom we want to listen. This is the one whose word we want to hear and heed because he is the one who has it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and for uh, this amazing picture, these two pictures, one verbal and one visual of your authority and your hand in the events of the world around us, your hand in the events that will be unfolding both in our own day and later during the tribulation period. Lord, we thank you that you have it, that you are the sovereign, self-existent Lord. And we thank you that we serve a Messiah who has it and that he loves us and he has given himself for us and that he has already made us a kingdom and priests to serve you, our Father. Lord, we thank you for this reminder. Stir our hearts to trust you. In Yeshua's name, amen. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to our brother, Brian, as he leads us in a, a song of response to the word of the Lord. He's got this. Let's sing to him. Eternal God unchanging, mysterious and yet known. Your boundless love, unfailing grace and mercy shown. Bright seraphim in ceaseless flight around your glorious throne. They raise their voices day and night in praise to you alone. Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Lord, we are weak and frail, helpless in the storm. Surround us with your angels, hold us in your arms. 
a cold and ruthless enemy. His pleasure is our heart. Rise up, O Lord, and he will flee before our sovereign God. Hallelujah. Glory be to our great God. Hallelujah. Glory be to our great God. Let every creature in the sea and every flying bird, let every mountain, every field, and valley of the earth. Let all the moons and all the stars in all the universe sing praises to the living God who rules them by his word. Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah. Glory be to our great God. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you. Uh, appreciate your uh, leading us in worship, helping us to uh, sing our praises of the one uh, whose uh, glorious uh, picture uh, we saw for us uh, depicted in the text this morning. I'd uh, like to uh, conclude with the ironic uh, benediction and then uh, some uh, parting comments uh, for those who are with us via Facebook Live. So let's go out with the sound of the Lord's blessing in our ears, uh, this beautiful picture of God's heart, his desire, Lord, uh, that the Lord wants to bless his people, that he wants to bless Israel, he wants to bless our Jewish people, and he wants to bless all people, Jewish and Gentile, who are his through faith in Messiah. Yosem lecha, shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Shabbat shalom, b'shem Yeshua, sar shalom, Sabbath peace in the name of Yeshua the Prince of Peace. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. And so I, I'm going to say goodbye uh, to our friends who joined us on Facebook this morning. Uh, please plan to join us again uh, next week, Lord willing. And uh, you can find out more about the olive tree online on our website, www.olive-tree.org. And uh, please feel free to send us an email and we would be happy to uh, serve you in any way we can. So thank you. God bless you and have a Shavua Tov, a great blessed week.